is 3 p.m. live from our studio in New York City. I'm Julie Hyman, that is Josh Lipton, and this is Yahoo Finance Live. Here's what we're watching this afternoon. It's a crucial week for monetary policy around the world. The final Fed meeting of the year, it gets underway tomorrow with the news conference from Jay Powell on Wednesday. We'll look at what we expect to hear from him and as well from the European Central Bank and Bank of England, they meet on Thursday. Plus, Novo Nordisk is Yahoo's company of the year. Thanks to the surging popularity of Wagovi and Ozempic, we're looking at the ripple effects of weight loss drugs, especially for restaurant stocks. And the weight loss drug craze is what we're watching in Goodbye or Goodbye. Find out what stock in the healthcare space is one to consider adding to your portfolio and another to avoid. We'll help you navigate these choices later this hour. Let's get you up to speed on the market action or perhaps lack thereof, Josh, because today we sort of have a little bit of a muddle, right? So stocks, yes, are to the upside, but not moving by much. The Dow and the S&P each up by about a quarter percent. That translates to about a 100-point gain for the Dow, relatively modest here. The Nasdaq's only up a tenth of 1%. Communication services is lagging today, so that accounts for the underperformance of the Nasdaq. Industrials, consumer staples, financials are some of the best-performing groups that we are seeing in the S&P 500 today. Yeah, so maybe not too surprising. It's kind of, let's call it muted today on this yes. Monday. I and mean, we've had, you know, after the rally that we've had and, you know, given the week we're about to have, we got some... Um, key economic data, key inflation data, November CPI, that's going to be on tap. And obviously that's been, you know, moving in the direction Jay Powell would like to see. Um, it's been cooling. It's been moderating. I think there are some questions, though, about that last mile, Julie, mm. how, you know, getting back to that 2% target, how challenging that's going to be. And if you saw a print that came in maybe a bit hotter than expected, what kind of impact that could have, could that kind of you know, throw some cold water on, on folks who are betting, not just on rate cuts next year, but a lot of calls from some smart people who think they're going to come sooner rather than later. So a lot of eyes on that print. Right. If you look at the expectations for it right now, it's an estimate for no change in headline inflation, at least on a month over month basis. And then, of course, we're going to get the Fed, right? And the Fed will account for some of what we heard from CPI. And we'll see if J. Powell and company indicate that they're ready to start talking about talking about yeah. cutting. You know, that's been some of the language that he's used. Are we even going to open the discussion that we're ready to start maybe uh, talking about cutting at some point next year. He's been very careful and very tentative with that language. Yeah. The market, of course, has not really bought the line from the Fed, either the rhetoric or the dot plot for that matter, that the Fed is gonna wait to the latter half of next year. Um, but we'll see if what we hear this week changes that calculus. Yeah, I mean, I, it'll be fat. It's the last Fed decision of 2023, or last scheduled Fed decision, we yeah. said 2023, right? And so to your point exactly, I think, um, listen, the market's clear here. They, they don't expect the Fed to move. But what the Fed says, what mm -hmm. they do, I think will be really, really interesting, just in terms of the color and commentary that Powell gives us at that meeting about some of the key economic data we already had. It'll be interesting to see what he thinks about the labor market, given that job, jobs report, what he thinks about inflation, the trajectory of inflation from here, you know, and how he thinks about sort of these kind of easing financial conditions as well. Yeah, and just one more quick thing to mention, sort of the backdrop for strategists right now. We continue to get relatively bullish forecasts. The latest coming from John Stolfus over at Oppenheimer, who's already been relatively bullish. His target for next year, 5,200 for the S&P 500. So he's not the highest out there, but he's yeah. on the upper end. And it seems like that the, the sort of um, equity strategist um, consensus is sort of coalescing around 5,000 or above for the S&P 500. I'm a big fan of John. It could be a good time to get him back, I think. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. All right, shall we talk about what All else right. is going on today? Let's a lot of M&A. Let's some trending tickers here. Shares of Macy's, they are ripping higher today. Check that out, about 20%. Here's the news. The retailer considering a $5.8 billion buyout offer from real estate investor Arc House Management and asset manager Brigade Capital Management, a source familiar with the matter, confirming that story to Yahoo Finance late on Sunday. So this that headline has Macy's obviously moving a lot higher here today. Um, offers reportedly, Julie, $21 a share for the retailer. Stock higher today, though. Remember, of course, we know, you know before this headline, it was actually down about 15% for the year. We know, listen, Macy's, like a lot of retailers, has, you know, had some challenges. Last month, remember, they reported a 7% same-store sales drop 
in Q3. Analysts crunching the numbers, trying to figure out the value of the real estate portfolio in particular, because that's really in focus here. The team at Cowan says, by their math, that real estate is worth at least $7.5 billion, maybe as much as $11.6 billion. They say Herald Square here in New York City is actually, in, in their opinion, probably the most attractive and significant piece of that portfolio. They emphasize unlocking that value, though, may or may not be realistic. Obviously, it depends on a lot of variables here. Usage, time horizon, restrictions, developer appetite. Yeah, I mean, Macy's obviously a storied uh, chain here, but we see a lot of movement within retail. And even Macy's itself has come under activist pressure before yep. to make some changes. If you look at its footprint right now, it's got about 500 stores, about 30 or so, more than 30 Bloomingdale's. And remember, they bought Blue Mercury, so they have 160 Blue Mercury's. Now, Paul Lejouet over at uh, City is talking about the value of the real estate, but he's also talking that about maybe shrinking the footprint. He says they need to do more than they have done in terms of shrinking, and they already have been shrinking. They've wanted to retain a presence in certain markets, he says. Maybe under private ownership, they would be more willing to shrink the, the footprint and do what's necessary to get uh, to get it to be a healthier retailer. Yeah, I mean, the, in high strokes, I mean, certainly the the whole the idea of taking a private does just that, right? So right. you get greater kind of flexibility, a certain amount of leeway to make changes faster. It'll be it'll be interesting to see how this one develops. Yes, it will. And then there's another deal that looks like it's not happening. <laughs> Let's talk about that one. Shares of Cigna popping today after reportedly calling off its pursuit of a merger with rival Humana. Humana shares edging lower, but not by that much today. Cigna also announcing an additional $10 billion stock buyback, bringing its total repurchase program to $11.3 billion. Now, Cigna never confirmed publicly that it was seeking Humana, and it has not publicly confirmed, although there have been re right. reports that it's done here with doing this. But uh, David Cordani, the CEO, did say, as we look at the broader landscape and the strategic opportunities before us, we will remain financially disciplined with a clear focus on executing against our strategy. He said that in the statement about the buyback, but there's some implicit messaging in there, it feels like, uh, about the deal as well. Yeah, you never had confirmation, but we did have these reports. Remember, mm -hmm. shareholders, some were not big fans of this deal. They were worried about dilution to Cigna shareholders because, because you know, this, this apparently would have been a cash and stock transaction. Right or at least a big stock component there. And also throw in you know, worries about perhaps regulatory scrutiny, how long this would probably take to get a deal done. It just sounded like it got pretty complicated pretty quickly. So maybe better, you know, if you're Cigna's C-suite to think, you know what, let's let this one go. Instead, let's announce you know, some capital return news. I mean, it's been pretty incredible the amount of deal activity that has gone on in this industry. Cigna yep. tried to buy Aetna, that didn't work. Then it was bought by CVS, remember? Cigna did buy Express Scripts. United Healthcare has been making acquisitions. You know, there's just been a lot of activity in this space, and Cigna reportedly is also uh, trying to sell off one of its Medicare businesses. So there's still a lot of moving parts. A lot of moving parts, but it comes down to capital return. Investors seem happy with that one. Yeah. And then last up here, let's check out shares of Occidental Petroleum. How are they are trading today? It looks like trading up last time I checked. About well, nine tenths of percent. They are announcing an agreement to buy share oil producer Crown Rock in a deal valued at around twelve billion dollars. So uh, this one, obviously Crown Rock, Texas shale driller. Um, I actually did not realize though how big it was, Julie, until I read it. Bloomberg noting it's in fact the third largest closely held oil producer in the Permian Basin. Produces about 170,000 barrels of oil equivalent per day. It's backed by private equity firm Lime Rock Partners and really kind of just part of this much bigger trend we've been seeing here in the space. Yes. Yeah, apparently this billionaire, Timothy Dunn, is the guy who put this together here. Um, and so he's obviously gonna get a big, big payout from this. But there has been a veritable Permian arms race that has been going on here in just the last few months of the year. We have, of course, Exxon's a $60 billion deal to buy Pioneer. We have Chevron's $53 billion um, acquisition of Hess. And there is just this push by the large oil companies to try and buy more in the Permian. One interesting side note about this is that um, there are reports that Occidental is not going to get Berkshire Hathaway financing help. Yeah, I did see um, that. To that buy this, which is sort of an interesting little side note. Berkshire owns about a quarter of Occidental Petroleum, has been gradually building up its stake. We know also that the CEO of Occidental, Vicki Holub, does meet pretty regularly with uh, Warren Buffett. So unclear if she talked to him specifically about this deal, 
But um, it, it's just an interesting sort of side note whenever we talk about I think another interesting, you mentioned um, how Crown Rock is run by Tim Dunn. Yes. And that's kind of another interesting angle here because Tim Dunn, well-known Republican donor, you know, as Reen reports, he, he's actually spent something like $20 million over the last 10 years to support different conservative politicians. And he's thought to be probably another, you know, donor to watch, certainly in 2024 right. elections. So that's well, another interesting wrinkle to that one. Now he's going to have some more money. That is true. To more to spend. Away, it seems. All right. Well, investors looking to sustain year-end momentum after the S&P 500 and NASDAQ have reached six consecutive weekly gains. It comes as Wall Street waits on the Federal Reserve's last policy decision of the year. Here with what all of this means for investors heading into 2024, we've got Gargi Chaudhry, who is BlackRock's head of iShares Investment Strategy Americas. Gargi, great to see you. Thanks so much for being here. I want to start with the once, I don't know, not so sexy area of asset allocation, right? Because we have seen money pouring into cash this year because people wanted to take advantage of those high yields. You say now would be a good time to start thinking about pivoting because of where we are in the cycle. Can you lay that out for us? Sure thing. Hi, Julie and Josh. It's great to be back on the show. Hope you guys are doing well. Uh, so to your point, the framework that we lay out in the Aisha's Year Ahead Outlook is exactly to your point around why this might be a good time for investors to step out of cash. And, you know, what we're looking at is this period that we believe we're now in, which is the pause period, right? Uh, we don't expect the Fed to go this week. We believe that the July hike was the last one, which means that they're now going to just leave rates on hold for some time and just see how the economy evolves. Uh, you know, I think we're going to hear from Chair Powell that it's too premature to start talking about a rate cut. What this means for investors, though, is historically, when we look at the period six months into the first cut or six months after the first cut and then the period of the pause, we found that where investors do the best is actually in that rate pause period. And thank you for bringing that chart up. So whether you're in the bond markets, whether you're in the equity markets, investing in this pause period is really important. And there is a little bit of urgency around it because eventually we think by the end of, uh, by the second half of 2024, the Fed will begin to cut rates. So get out of cash now, take advantage of some of these incredible yields that we're getting in the fixed income markets, especially in the belly of the curve, take advantage of quality companies that are still available to you at reasonable prices and, uh, you know, sort of put your cash to work for you. And, and when you say put your cash to work for you in the equity market, certain, certain sectors, certain areas where you think it's going to be most attractive in 2024? Sure, yeah. So, you know, obviously 2023 has been a good year for investors. Uh, you know, whether or not you were in the Magnificent Seven or even if you broadened out your portfolio, you had a positive return. And now we think that 2024 will continue to be a year where quality, so what we mean by that is looking at companies with low leverage, healthy balance sheets, companies with stable earnings growth, as well as uh, availability of cash, those factors will really determine which companies and which uh, sectors of the market continue to do well. So looking at something like the quality ticker, looking at large gap growth like IWY, uh, looking at ways in which we can even take advantage of some of the, what we call the lovable laggards, some of the areas that haven't done as well. Um, you know, healthcare is top of mind there where obviously not a great year 2023, but still quality and you have that earnings growth that's going to come in 2024. And that's what we think investors should focus on for the for at least the first couple of months of 2024, keeping quality in mind as we go away from, move away from this very resilient earn, uh, growth picture to a slowing growth picture in the first quarter of 2024. Yeah, I saw that lovable laggards moniker in your note, which I like. Um, explain for us a little more. You talked a little bit about that you want to see companies that are going to start re-accelerating earnings growth next year. What else makes a mm -hmm. laggard lovable? How do you know which laggards to look at? <laughs> Listen, we're looking at a variety of our indicators. So we obviously look at, you know, what the technicals have been. Have investors been overweight or underweight those areas of the market? What are earnings growth going to look like? What have flows been in those areas of the market? And what is the macro backdrop for, for those sectors? And I think, you know, we talked about healthcare where we think earnings growth is going to be great. I think, you know, I heard you guys talking about the GLP-1 drugs and the impact of that. I think that 
you know, obviously has some incredible potential and we think pharmaceuticals could benefit from that. But on the flip side, we think medical devices have been unfortunately beat up in a meaningful manner. Look, you know, none of the GLP-1 drugs impact on medical devices are going to come in the first three months of 2024. So finding some of those laggards that have been beat up either on technical reasons or on just some of these macro fundamentals that have gone too far we think makes sense. And again, similarly with financials, again, an area that has certainly lagged for good reason. And we think that if we continue to see a yield curve steepening, continue to have positive but slowing growth, uh, again, the high quality part of financials and broadly large cap as well as quality High, good balance sheet companies with low leverage like Qual continue to do well in uh, the first few months of 2024. So we talked about where to pick your spots in equities. Um, what about, mm -hmm. you know, what about in fixed income? Because, OK, if you're getting out of cash, you're not going to put it all um, in equities right now. We've talked to some people who are starting to say maybe go out further in duration. Mm -hmm. Where do you sit in that debate? Absolutely, Julian. I've been on this show and we've discussed this together with you before that, you know, these yields that we have been getting in the fixed income markets are just, you know, yield of dreams. And no doubt we've seen a little bit of a rally already. November, in fact, was one of the best months for the AGG, for the ag since uh, 80, 1985. So we've certainly seen some of that fixed income, the income working for you, but this is not the end. Uh, we do think investors, you know, to your point, you're not stepping out of cash directly into the, uh, you know, directly into equity markets. You should have a combination, a diversified basket of equities and bonds. And for the first time, bonds are actually giving you some very healthy returns. Here again, the quality idea resonates with me. So in, in equity markets, as, as well as fixed income markets, you want to look at the quality parts of fixed income in what we call the belly of the curve. So don't be in the very front end, don't be in the very long end, but be in the intermediate part. So we think the three to seven year part of the fixed income markets with tickers such as IEI or even the AG make a lot of sense. And then if you're looking to take risk, if you're looking for some, some of those carefully picked spots in the market, we think going active with tickers like BINC, BlackRock Income, which is actively managed and looks at emerging markets, looks at securitized assets, we think that makes a lot of sense. And emerging markets as such, given where they are in the rate cutting cycle, make a lot of sense. So something like an EMB uh, for a little bit more volatile outcomes make sense in a portfolio as well. And Garg, you just, uh, I'm interested also just your take on the broader U.S. economy in 2023. Is, is part of your thesis, Garg, just a bet you're making on, on the soft landing camp? I think the part of the thesis that we're making here is that given all the data we have in front of us, that there's going to be a slowdown in growth, but nothing yet points to a sharp deceleration in growth and nothing yet points to a deep recession. Look, can we have a negative quarter of growth? Maybe, but are we going to have a you know period like we saw in the financial crisis or a period that we saw during the COVID pandemic? We don't think so. And as a result of that, even if we get a shallow, shallow slowdown, or a soft landing, we think being in the higher quality parts of the equity market with some guardrails. You know, we talk a little bit about owning some buffered strategies, which uh, does give you a little bit of protection to the downside if the market exhibits some volatility with tickers like IVVM. It makes a lot of sense in your portfolio. So have some equity guardrails, be up in quality, intermediate parts of the fixed income market for that incredible income. Garji Chaudhry, thank you so much as always for joining us. We appreciate that time and insight. Thank you. And we're just getting started here on Yahoo Finance Live. Coming up, earnings after the bell. We're going to bring you Oracle's second quarter results and provide in-depth analysis. And a new installment of our series, Goodbye or oh, Goodbye. We'll look at the weight loss drug craze from an investment standpoint and tell you how to play it. And after the break, we dig into how those weight loss drugs could disrupt food and restaurant brands. All that and more when Yahoo Finance returns.
Yahoo Finance has named its company of the year, and it is not one of the Magnificent Seven, believe it or not. It is, in fact, the creator of weight loss drugs, Ozempic and Wagovi, Novo Nordisk. That company's stock soaring 45% year to date as the drugs have dominated cultural conversations from boardrooms to dining tables. As popularity grew, waistlines slimmed, and investors frantically debated how these drugs could disrupt industries as consumers overhaul their lifestyles, particularly, of course, for food and restaurant brands. Brooke De Palma has been speaking with some of the main players to assess that impact, Brooke. Good afternoon. I mean, certainly this is something that in mid-October, it was all these doomsday predictions as so many investors really frantically flock to, to sell off shares of food makers like Kraft Heinz, as well as Hershey's causing shares to move lower. But since most of them have rebounded, consumer staples also took a hit as companies like Walmart warned that consumers that were on these drugs were changing the way that they shopped, going to more smaller pack sizes, as well as more healthier alternatives. But what we now know is that volumes of dry foods are still up in the last 12 months. We also know that frozen and prepared foods also remain higher year over year. And investors, uh, investors' reaction, that is, may have been overblown to these frantic predictions that were made. Analysts telling Yahoo Finance that even in a bull case scenario where 7% of the U.S. population were on these weight loss drugs by 2030, that would only result in a low single-digit decline in same-source sales. Now, after such doomsday predictions that hit consumer stocks in October, it even took Novo Nordic's CEO by surprise. Take a listen. So my, my view is that some of those reactions are perhaps a bit exaggerated, but, but there's no doubt that uh, with the intervention we see now with the GF1-based uh, medicines, you see significant shift in consumer behavior and, uh, and, and some of these categories will be impacted. I think it's gradual or quite some time. Um, so my, my base view is that it's perhaps a bit uh, of an overreaction and we saw some fast food stocks like McDonald's also take a hit in addition to Wendy's. But when I asked McDonald's CEO Chris Kamchensky over the phone if he's seeing any impact, he told Yahoo Finance we're seeing no impact today with GLP ones and that nobody has any idea what the impact is going to be in the future. It is something that the company is keeping a close eye on. But McDonald's same source sales continue to grow year over year in the latest quarter quarter, we saw an 8.1% increase in sales. And so, Josh, this is something that many fast food stocks, many fast food executives, rather, have a close eye on right now. All right. Stick around. Well, great stuff on there. I want to keep you here for this next interview. So it looks as if the immediate disruption fears over GLP-1 drugs may have settled, but the medium and long-term risk the consumer sector still, of course, in question. For a deeper outlook on this, let's bring in Andrew Charles. He is T.D. Cowan's senior research analyst of the restaurant sector, and Brooke De Palma still here with me as well. So, Andrew, uh, Brooke set it up great there for us, and as she noted, some are arguing that this sort of investor response, this investor reaction, to these new weight loss medicines, Andrew, may appear kind of overblown, at least in terms of the near term. Is that your take? Hey, Josh, good to see you. Uh, I would agree with what you just said. I think this is something that we're uh, certainly monitoring. I think the catalyst path ahead as we think about the fact around insurance coverage, as we think about an oral version of the drug, as we think about you know expanded supply chain, you know, this is something where I think the narrative uh, will come back. You know, we're fully uh, we're fully expecting that. Uh, I think you guys nailed it that it was kind of in the, in the October time frame, maybe in the beginning of November, that we really had, were fielding quite a bit of few calls on this from investors. That certainly tapered off. Um, you know, and look, I think that, you know, this is something that as we think about the long term impact here, we've collaborated with our TD uh, Cal and Pharma team, who's got a 2030 target of 14 million users or so, roughly 10 million for diabetes and 4 million for weight loss. And you know, if we think about that and around how many calories they're reducing, we think it gets to about a cumulative 70 basis points of calorie reduction across the United States. And what's important about that is that that's, if we think about that linearly, and that that's about 10 basis points per year leading up to that, we have the restaurant industry growing three to 4%. And so totally appreciate there's a pretty robust catalyst path ahead for this dynamic and for this drug. But when you kind of start doing the math behind it, our view is that this is really all bark and no bite, no pun intended.
<laughs> Andrew, let's say that investors want to play it a bit safe here. What are some names that you're encouraging investors to go to should this become a larger issue longer term? Yeah, so Brooke, great question. You know, I think there is a misconception in the market that we work with our uh, pharmaceutical teams. This isn't a people are going to eat healthier. It's more of a general appetite suppressant. And so some of the healthier position names, if you will, from a lower calorie perspective, uh, those are not where we want to be you know, focusing. What I think is really important is really about party size. And what I mean by that is that the occasions that skew more to delivery and skew more to dining out – uh, AKA skew less to a single eater occasion, I think those are going to be your most insulated. And so of the names we follow, we think that it's it's Domino's, it's Wingstop, it's Darden, as well as First Watch, which are the names that just kind of fit in more of a uh, protected status versus the more single eater occasions that are more popular, traditional quick service and fast casual. All right. So some, some stock picks there, Andrew, uh, which I know viewers appreciate. In terms of just a different sector, I know you're restaurants, but if you look at the package food category, Andrew, would your take be that's maybe uh, more risk than the names you cover of potentially at least medium to long terms from some of these new weight loss drugs? Yeah, so I'm, I'm very lucky to be working with Rob Moscow. He's been at Cowan now and, and launched uh, for about four months now. And uh, he and I have discussed how packaged food is going to be more impacted given that it skews more to uh, single leader occasions. And so you're right, that restaurants are certainly something that we're hearing about, but my conversations with Rob's just, it's been more active uh, at least two months ago around the conversation around GLP-1s. And our view as a house is that you're gonna see packaged foods more impacted relative to our restaurants. Innovation really seems to be the name of the game moving into 2024 to grab consumers' attentions. Could we see restaurant chains really change up their menus, really adhere to that healthy, cautious, or uh, more conscious consumer? Will we see more salads? Will we see more uh, protein snack boxes, perhaps? What's your take on that? Unlikely. Um, I think mm. what you're more likely to see is certainly more innovation with chicken. Uh, we know that beef is likely to be inflationary next year, while ch chicken is a commodity uh, likely to be more more benign. So I think more innovation on the chicken side, as a lot of the beef producer or sorry concepts that skew to beef, excuse me, are more likely to uh, skew more to or going to try to boost their chicken mix, which is higher margin and skews younger. And then beverages as well remain a, a big focus in the sector, uh, particularly given the success of Starbucks and Dutch Bros with um, ice beverages that are quite high margin, you're seeing in general uh, folks definitely wanting to see more beverage sales um, and so really help boost the margin profile that way. So, so Brooke, maybe not so much on the healthier side, just more so on the higher margin, what skews younger uh, between beverage opportunities as well as chicken. And Andrew, I got to get you out of here on this question. Another name you cover is Shake Shack. That was making some headlines. CEO is going to be retiring in 2024. Just interested, Andrew, to get your take on that news and your rating on the stock. Yeah, we're market perform on this one. You know, I think that what you're seeing there is the opportunity for them to really, um, you know, Randy Grudy did a great job of taking this to roughly 500 stores around the globe when you include their licensed business. What I think Shake Shack has the, an opportunity to do right now is to find someone who can scale this uh, to the next couple hundred stores and really be able to uh, really lean in more to its scale as an organization. Uh, and really, the brand here is so much bigger than the, the the store base that it has in place right now. And so the opportunity is to really build this brand higher in a really scaled way, uh, I think, is what Shake Shack has the opportunity to do here. So very eager to hear who the successor is going to be, of course. They are going external for this, which I think is the right move. Um, so we'll stay tuned on that one to see who uh, who they find. All right, Andrew Charles, T.D. Cowens, Managing Director of Consumer and Restaurants. My, our thanks for joining us today. And, of course, our thanks to Brooke De Palma as well. And coming up, new installment of our series, Goodbye or Goodbye. We're going to be looking at healthcare stocks around the GLP-1 craze and tell you which ones are a buy and which ones you should avoid. That's next.
It's a big, noisy universe of stocks out there. Welcome to Goodbye or Goodbye, brought to you by E-Trade from Morgan Stanley. Our goal to help cut through that noise to navigate the best moves for your portfolio. Today, we're examining an investment topic that has gained traction in the back half of the year. It's weight loss drugs. It's hard to avoid the term Ozempic, especially after a number of celebrities admitted to using the drug. As quickly as the buzz came, the narrative also has turned to overhype. So how should you play it? I'm here with Tom Hayes, Great Hill Capital Chairman and Managing Member. And so let's get to your buy stock within this theme. That is Baxter International, which is more on the device side of the equation. Of course, companies like this, and you can see it on the stock chart, have been hit really hard by this weight loss drug craze. And as you point out, that's one of the reasons to like it, maybe. Absolutely. This stock is down 65% since its 2021 high. It's down because of the Hillron, Hillrom acquisition. They used a lot of debt on that. It's underperformed expectations, but we're starting to see that turnaround. Margins are improving sequentially, so that's very good. Then they had the supply chain issues from COVID. Like all these companies, they built up their inventory tremendously at high cost. They've been working through that inventory for the last two quarters. So we're starting to see the margin expansion there. And then, of course, the GLP-1 fears. That was the final nail in the coffin. You saw it on the yeah. uh, lower lower right side of that chart. Yeah, we can take uh, it back for a real quick. Yeah, and then look you at see this it. right here. Yeah, most definitely. Uh, that was when there. everyone was saying everyone's going to lose weight. No one is ever going to get a medical uh, procedure again <laughs> because we're going to be healthy. But the problem is, even if they're correct and we lose all that weight, we all go out and play pickleball and we have knee problems, we have shoulder problems, we have hip problems, we play golf, we get more active. So uh, those are the three reasons that it's down. We think the valuation is tremendous here, which right. uh, goes to our next point. Yeah. So let's talk about the valuation a little bit. Valuation and performance, as you point out. And you're looking specifically at the price to sales ratio yeah. as a measure of valuation. Obviously, you've seen that come down also. Yeah. It's trading at 1.2 times sales. This is very, very low historically and just absolutely. Uh, it's also trading its historic PE multiple, price to earnings multiple, uh, historically has been about 19 times because this has been a grower. This business has compounded capital, return on invested capital of double digits for decades now. So this is a proven business, but the PE multiple is trading down to 12 times next year's earnings uh, in opposition to its average multiple of 19 times. Uh, and that's largely due to the kidney business. The renal care business is mm -hmm. the slowest growth division, uh, and they're going to spin that out to shareholders. Gotcha. So, uh, so you that, think that should unlock some value? And just yeah. to point out to our viewers, this is about, I think, a 10-year chart here, or nearly so. So it shows you definitely over the long term just how low that price-to-sales ratio is on a comp, um, comparative basis. And so you mentioned one potential catalyst for recovery. That is the spinoff of that renal business. Yeah. What are some of the other potentials? Well. Uh, a couple of things. First off, they sold off the biopharma business. That They got $4 billion of that. So that's going to help them deleverage. That's been a weight, the interest expense. That's going to take about $180 million a year of interest expense out of the business. Mm. The key thing about that renal care spin is that once you take the slowest growth division out of the equation and that spun to shareholders, what's remaining, Baxter Co., uh, Remain Co., uh, that's going to start to trade re-rate at a higher multiple because it has a higher growth rate. Management is pers uh, expecting prospectively that it's going to grow revenues at 4 to 5 percent. The margins are improving sequentially as we work through the supply chain issues. So we really like the story. We think Baxter can work its way back to $60 over the next 12 to 24 months. So it's a longer term play. Gotcha. There'll be some bumps in, a in the road along the way, but we do think the GLP hype is a little overblown here. Okay, so what we like to ask people what the biggest risk then is for that bullish case here. And you're saying maybe it has to do with pricing power. Yeah, I think, you know, management has in their assumption of the long-term top line growth rate of four to five percent that they're going to have some pricing power and the risk to that is they have competition that has have similar products out there and they don't innovate quickly enough but uh, they've shown a track record of innovation even on the pharma side with their launches uh, their injection business etc so we're pretty confident that this is not going to come to bear mm -hmm. but it's something to keep in mind as a risk okay so that's your goodbye looking yeah. at this whole weight loss universe yeah. let's talk about the stock you're saying adios to yeah. in this scenario and that is Eli Lilly which is your goodbye in this scenario. So let's walk through the thesis 
on this one. You say it's already priced for perfection, so right. maybe not a lot of room for error. That's correct. One. So it's priced in a lot of really, really good news. Uh, it's historically traded at, at about uh, 27 times earnings. It's mm. trading at 48 times next year's earnings. Uh, as opposed to Baxter, which is trading at 1.2 times sales. This is trading at 15 times sales. This is unprecedented. You're paying for fif not 15 years of profit. You're paying for 15 years, basically, of revenue. Uh, and uh, we understand the growth. We understand the valuation. But this has really just gotten too ahead of itself even if you believe all the good things are going to happen. Right, and we should just mention there actually happened to have been some news today yeah. on Eli Lilly. ZepBound, which is their specific weight loss drug that is the uh, basically counterpart to Manjaro, the, yeah. uh, the uh, diabetes drug, there was a new study that came out and said people who were on it, once they were off it for a year, they gained back half of their weight. Yeah. Now, they're still a lot lighter than they used to be, but nonetheless, that was hitting the stock a little bit in yeah. today's session. So just something to think about as well for folks. So competition with lower prices is one of the other things that you're looking yeah. at. Yeah, expectations here. are these type of drugs, the GLP-1s, uh, number one, you got to pay the thousand or fourteen hundred dollars a month, or it starts to come back uh, both on this one and we've, we, you know, it's expected on the other ones. Uh, but it's expected that the price of these drugs is going to uh, erode from fourteen thousand a year down to three thousand a year mm. over the next decade, uh, and it's going to become a me too product. There are already multiple companies that make similar drugs, right. so there's going to be more and more enter the fray. Well, and then there's the question of okay, and who exactly is going to pay for it when you're looking at? this thing, let's go here. So in other words, is insurance gonna cover it? Yeah, and, and so far the jury is still out because if you look at the excess cost of a diabetic is about $9,000 a year for the insurance companies. Right now some of these top tier drugs are fourteen to $18,000 a year. So the math equation doesn't work just yet. That might get better. But best case scenario, they're expecting the analysts, and you, and you heard before, about 15% of the morbidly obese people will be on it within 10 years. So that's a kind of a relatively small portion of the population. If you think about the top 10% of households, 190,000 of income, if they're self-payers, $14,000 a year is a lot of money. It, yeah. you know, and that, what about the other 90% of the population that may need it? Yeah, okay, so what could go right for Eli Lilly and therefore wrong for your thesis here? If we can get that to come up, I think we're a little fro. Oh, there we go, insurance coverage begins to accelerate. Yeah, I, I think uh, as the costs come down, the, the equation may improve for insurance companies to start to cover. They may say, if we put them on this at 5,000 a year, 7,000 a year, we're gonna have to pay for a lot less procedures down mm. the road as their health gets better. Um, the other thing is they have uh, an Alzheimer's drug that, that's uh, expected to be approved. Right. Maybe the results will be better than expected. That could be a, a complete game changer. Uh, so there are some positive catalysts here, certainly that uh, uh, could change this thesis. And, and we do think it's gonna con continue to put out great products. Uh, it's just we're not willing to pay this current okay, price. Okay, and just quickly, do you, do you have positions in either Baxter or Lilly? We own Baxter, we have no position in Lilly. Okay, yeah. thanks a lot, Tom. So let's sum up what you have told us here today. You're telling investors buy Baxter International based on the stock recently selling off. It's becoming cheaper on a valuation basis and there are some catalysts for recovery. On the other side, you're saying avoid Eli Lilly. It's already priced for perfection. The stock could face competition from those with lower prices and there are some problematic assumptions regarding pricing and how much insurance is going to cover. Tom Hayes, thanks so much for coming in. Appreciate so much, it. Julie. And thank you so much for watching Goodbye or Goodbye. We're going to be bringing you new episodes three times a week at 3.30 p.m. Eastern. We'll be right back.
Wild moves in Bitcoin today, the cryptocurrency plunging now on the verge of breaking below $40,000. Jared Blickery is here with a closer look. Jared. I haven't seen this in a while. Dark red on the Bitcoin heat map down 7% over the last 24 hours. And here is the offending uh, movement right here. Well, it was Sunday night or early Monday morning, depending on where you live in the world. We got a little flash crash here. It was a 5 to 6% drop in only a few moments. Um, Bitcoin very illiquid trading, especially overnight. Sometimes air pockets will exist, uh, but it can be really harrowing to go through. The net result is we're back down testing 40,000 right down here. And if you take a look at the other crypto movements over the last 24 hours, we saw even worse movements in Cardano. That's down 13%. FTT USD down 11%. Uh, the list goes on. Just want to show you what's happening in crypto stocks as well. Uh, Hive down 20%. It looks like HUT down 15%. Uh, Marathon Digital down 12%, but you temper that by what's happened over the last month, and it's really just a drop in the bucket. Now, HUD's still down 20%, but backed up 96%. Marathon up 52%. Coinbase up 49%. And by the way, Coinbase getting a lot of attention as Kathy Wood has been selling some of it. Uh, we know her movements in and out in her funds day to day, but we don't know the reasons why. Sometimes she just sells because price has appreciated to a certain degree. Over the last three months, in fact, over the last month, we've seen about a 70 percent. Uh, we've seen about a 70 percent return in this particular stock. And there you go. Almost 300 percent year to date. So locking in some of those gains. Before I move on, just wanted to show you some of the crypto flows that we've seen, which have really pick, picked up over the last few weeks, uh, really over the last two months. And uh, let's see if we can get back to my crypto flows. There we go. And this goes back to the beginning of the year. All of these are uh, 1 through 48. Well, we're going to go up to 52 weeks in the year. And we have 200 to $300 million uh, worth of money being added to crypto funds every single week. And those crypto funds are really in focus right now because we know that the spot Bitcoin ETF has been forthcoming. A lot of the hype around and movement around Bitcoin has been centered on these. Don't know exactly when it's going to happen, but January 5th to January 10th, very much the expected window there. Looking at next year, we got the halving, et cetera. But I've said it before, the uh, short-term trend in crypto, especially Bitcoin, is strongly up. We're going to have some setbacks here. And as we test some of this price memory that we have all the way up to about 60,000. There's going to be some hiccups, but the trend is definitively bullish, guys. Mm, we'll see when that kicks back into gear. Thanks, Jared. Appreciate it. Well, it has been a brutal housing market for home buyers between the lack of inventory, high prices, and high mortgage rates. But that doesn't seem to be affecting some of the home builder stocks. Joining us now is John Lavallo, UBS Home Builders and Building Products Analyst, to talk about the outlook for this space. So, John, wanted to start sort of big picture here, right? Um, because the home builders have been in an interesting position because of the tightness of the market. There seems to be a lot of demand for new inventory. So have we seen sort of a, a rising tide for all of the home builders as of late? Yeah, Julie, thanks for having me, first of all. I think that's exactly right. Um, the environment out there today is such that there is very little existing home supply. Think about it, mortgage rates went from three and a quarter up to almost 8% a month ago. They've trailed back about 90 basis points since then, but are still at very high levels. And when you put that in the context of something like 80% of mortgages in the U.S. being struck at 5% or below and almost 60% at 4% or below, that's created this lock-in effect where people don't want to move. They can't make that math work. And Surprisingly, demand, overall demand, has remained resilient. So the extent that someone wants to buy a home, today more than at any point in history, they've been forced to look at new homes. And I think when you couple that with the fact that the new home builders on the public side have the ability to offer a lot of attractive financing options, that has created a, a lot of market share wins for the public home builders. And to your point, has created this sort of rising tide lift all, lifts all boats for the publics. And John, I'm interested too, when you look at your coverage universe, you know, these home builders, John, have their business models kind of shifted at all in the last few years? For example, have they become uh, more efficient? 100%, Josh. Look, I think that this is something that is not 
fully understood or appreciated yet in the valuations of these stocks is if you went back a decade ago, in many cases, and not to be disparaging, but in many cases, these companies were looked at as land speculators that at the end of the day will put a home on to monetize that land. That has changed dramatically. They are truly focused on the home and on the community development. They have delevered. They carry less land. They carry better land. And in fact, they're doing much more, uh, you know, I would say, a diverse diversified things with their capital, where they're not putting every dollar of cash flow back into land. They're paying dividends, they're buying back stock. So they are much different companies and in our, in our view require a, probably a higher multiple. And to your point on the way they're building, they have be absolutely become more efficient as a function of COVID. They were forced to. They're offering less SKUs, they're building homes a lot more efficiently than they have in the past, and that's evident in the returns. Um, can they can sustain this level of returns going into 2024? A great question, and it's one that is highly debated at this point. I'll be honest with you, we are a little bit more cautious than I would say some of our sell side competitors. And we believe that the higher interest rate environment, and who knows where rates go, but let's just say they're higher for longer, is going to cause continued sort of incentivization, which will weigh on margins next year. Now, to be perfectly clear, we expect margins to remain above historical levels, but maybe trend down off of today's off of today's sort of you know mid-teens. If that is the case, you will see some normalization in returns. But let's be clear that even on our estimates that are call it 15% below our sell-side competitors, uh, the stocks still look very compelling from a valuation standpoint. And let's get to some names here, John. I think your, your uh, number one pick, correct me if I'm wrong here, is DR Horton, which is, listen, it's had a remarkable run, John. 2023, it's up about 55%. Is that your, your top pick heading into 2024 as well? You know, we haven't put, published our 2024 outlook yet. I would, you're absolutely correct to assume that that is our top pick as of today. And I think there's a number of reasons. One, it's the largest builder by volume, by a margin of around 20%. There's a lot of advantages to size and scale in home building. Uh, I would also tell you that they attack what we believe is the strongest part of the market, which is kind of that first time entry level buyer, which is a need based buyer. To the extent that they can buy a home, they will. They're getting married, they're having children, things that sort of necessitate more space. And then on top of that, this is a company that has uh, been a very efficient allocator of capital and a very, very good executor over time. John, especially for a company like DR Horton that is servicing first time home buyers, how are they? approaching the so-called affordability crisis, right? Or is it just that there's so much demand, it doesn't matter, some people are gonna to need to buy homes and so it's happening. Um, are DR and some of the other home builders making adjustments to sort of account for that as well? Great question. Um, yeah, look, I think that there's a number of factors going on right now. One, I think that they're building smaller homes a little further away from city centers. Um, two, they are doing something that has been incredibly powerful and that is buying down mortgage rates or offering incentives. So they're actually assisting the home buyer lower that mortgage rate through these buy down programs. And so if you're a, you know, if you're a, a buyer of a DR Horton home, you're not paying the headline rate of 7.2, maybe you're paying you know, 5.5, 5.6% somewhere in, in that ballpark. And that has proven incredibly powerful as a marketing tool for these home builders. And it's not just you know, DR Horton that's doing it, most of the builders are. So I think that you know the combination of building smaller homes, maybe a little further away from city centers, and these rate buy downs has been the key. The other thing I would mention is that you know we've done some survey work that would suggest that nearly a quarter of first time buyers report receiving financial assistance from parents or family members. So there is this large generational wealth transfer that is occurring in the U.S. that should remain a tailwind over the next you know five ten years. And John, I want to end here on, on a, one last name, get your, your take on it. NVR, John, it's also had a great year. Listen, it's up more than 40%, but on that one, you're neutral. Why are you on the sidelines there, John, and what would it take to get you more bullish? That's a great question. I mean, NVR arguably has the most uh, efficient build model out there. I mean, they are 100% of their land is purchased on option. They have the highest returns out there. There's a lot to like about NVR. Big market share in their markets as well. You know, in the attempt to sort of differentiate the way we're kind of looking at things with NVR is they are in sort of more mature markets than some of the other public home builders that really focus on kind of the Sun Belt areas. And, and because of that, we think that their growth is going to be a little bit slower. Now, they're not going to lag the group by much, but in, in the effort to sort of differentiate, that is how we've done it. And that's sort of on the growth profile. 
All right, John Lavallo, thank you so much for joining us today, John, for that insight and for those stock picks. We appreciate it. Thanks for having me. And coming up, closing bell on Wall Street. We'll check it in on the latest market moves, the top trending tickers. Stay tuned. We are just moments away from the closing bell on Wall Street. So we wanted to take a look back at some of the highlights from today's action. We did see stocks uh, sort of gradually move higher throughout the session. So still not a huge move, but the Dow now up, uh, what, 164 points, about four-tenths of 1%. The S&P 500 moving up by the same amount. The Nasdaq's been the laggard all day, but at least it's a little more solidly up now when you look at what's moving in today's session. Communication services, that's the XLC, has consistently been the laggard, so that's why it's been under pressure. But you got consumer staples and industrials and tech more broadly that's been trading higher today. So yeah. that's been sort of the push and pull. I mean, you got an interesting setup here because you have a pretty big week, November CPI, the Fed's last scheduled decision of 2023. I mean, depending what we hear this week, that could kind of set the tone for the rest of this year, maybe even start of next year. Yeah, most yeah. definitely. And just to go back here also, the other thing that has really been the theme of today is we had a merger Monday, or in some cases, an unmerger Monday, you know, sort of depending on what we were talking about. And this is reflected in the, in the trending tickers, just to take a look at where some of these big stories of the day are closing out here. We got Macy's up 19% on the yep. day after we have um, a bid for the company to take it private for $5.8 billion, right? You have reports that Cigna is not going to be going through on its pursuit of Humana. At the same time, it's announcing a buyback. That stock up 17% in today's session, and we have Occidental, there we go, Oxy, up 1%, even yep. though it's the acquirer in that case, so I guess people Part like that. Part of that bigger trend we've seen, right? Yeah, most definitely, the Permian Basin battle here for more uh, space, or, or more uh, property. There we have the closing bell on this Monday, as we've been talking about, a Monday ahead of a pretty big week here with CPI tomorrow morning, with the Fed uh, decision, or really, I mean, pretty much know it's not going to be a decision, but you know what they say is going to be quite important, as Josh pointed out, for the future path of where rates are going. And so the S&P uh, here finishing up four tenths of 1%, as did the Dow, 157 points when all said and done here, and the NASDAQ up about a fifth of 1% as we look at some of the closing numbers. Now, just a couple things to mention here. Even though it's not big gains today, we've got some highs. So the Dow highest since January 4th, 
2022. Those numbers just coming in from our Jared Blickery. The S&P highest since the end of March 2022. And the Nasdaq highest since April 1st of 2022. So because of the recent push upwards that we have seen, despite all of this talk, oh, maybe stocks are getting ahead of themselves given the outlook for rate cuts to mm -hmm. happen in the early part of next year, they're still going up unless yeah. we hear something different. <laughs> From the Fed. We'll see what Jay this Powell week. has to say about yes, all that. Yes, we will. All right, let's take a look at some trending tickers here as well. Let's start with Nike. Shares running into the green. Ah. After, there you go. <laughs> after City upgrades the stock from neutral to buy, raises target ahead of the company's quarterly results. So go to buy. The target goes to 135. And the, the basically telling clients this note, Julie, listen, top line challenges remain. But what they do like, they see gross margin recovery starting in Q2 2024, new innovation coming, they say, next year ahead of the Olympics and what they described as a solid position in China. Bottom line, they note one-of-a-kind brand with visible margin recovery creates, in their opinion, favorable risk-reward. Yeah, and, you know, it's interesting, too, because... Nike has sort of lost a little bit of its mojo. It was such a solid performer for so long. This has not been a great year for Nike. And the way that I took this note from Citi um, and Paul Lejouet over there is that what we have seen Nike doing is um, basically pricing its shoes to sell and sacrificing gross margin as a result. And what he says is now we're going to see that switch. Yep. And that even if they see sales a little weaker, and he does say that they are going to see sales a little weaker, that that gross margin is more than going to make up for it. So kind of a flip in the Nike strategy here that they're no longer going to be sacrificing sale, that they are going to be sacrificing sales, but making up for it with the gross margin. Yep. So we'll see if that actually comes to fruition. Um, at the same time, we also have a call out from Citi on Broadcom with a buy rating. Shares of the chipmaker are rising in today's uh, trading session as a result of that. And interesting here, we heard from Broadcom last week with its earnings, but the analyst over at Citi says that there's strength in the company's core business. They like the VMware acquisition as well, which recently closed. And what's interesting on a broader level, too, is that Broadcom has been on a tear recently. Huge. You know, so that's, move. Yeah. yeah, so that's been kind of the theme that you and I have been watching. Yeah, I mean, if you've been in Broadcom this year, you're sitting pretty. I mean, the stock just hit a record high. It's up now more than 80% in 2023. And most analysts are fans of this stock. I mean, it, they, they listen, they like this sweet, sweet. They like Hock Tan, the CEO. They like mm -hmm. this management team. You'll see, as you go through the notes, they really like um, the strategy under Hock Tan, the business model. Remember, they've been pivoting to higher margin software. And they see this company Company benefiting from exposure to AI within its networking business. You know, so that is another tailwind that has certainly been working for the Bulls this year. Yeah, and just want to point out, I've called up the semiconductors real quick on the Wi-Fi Interactive because what's been interesting as of late, and this is a trend that the Wall Street Journal pointed out today, uh, one of these things is not like the other, and it's yeah. the thing that was doing amazingly well. I'm talking about NVIDIA, of course. The stock is down 1.9% today, but that's been happening more recently that we have seen some of the other chip makers start to catch up with that NVIDIA monster move this year. Just today, not only do you have Broadcom, which still confusingly uh, its ticker is AVGO because of Avago, um, but ASML, AMD is higher, Intel up 4% on uh, the day. If you look at that versus the year-to-date performance, it is quite a different picture. NVIDIA, the clear leader, although everything else is up as well, it's just NVIDIA has been up more thus yeah. far this year. It has been, and part of that story has been the AI play, and it, continue, day, and course, it continues yes. to work for them. Yeah. Finally, let's end on Ring Central because there's some big changes there. CEO Tara Robitaille is resigning from the company effective December 8th, and this coming just a few short months after taking the helm. Ring Central's founder, Vlad Shmunis, to return to his full time role as chief executive officer. You know, Julie, uh, investors don't like surprises, and this yeah. was one, right? This was a big one. When your CEO abruptly exits, um, that caught them off guard. And as we noted, his appointment has only been in effect since late August, actually. Yeah. So um, now we have Vlad, founder and executive chairman, we returning as CEO. Company, we should note, did reiterate Q4 and annual guidance, but this this took some folks by surprise. Yeah, most definitely. And also Tarek Robiati was uh, CFO at HPE, 
So then he he came and joined Ring Central, you know, from another large company, and now exiting here. Not seeing a lot of explanation as what's happening here, but definitely analysts seeing this as abrupt and as a surprise. To your point here, uh, Piper Sandler saying that, uh, pointing out that uh, recently the CFO canceled a conference last week because of illness, and so really investors are trying to understand what's going on here, that they're looking for some kind of strategic change for the company. Yeah, I think a lot more questions here for sure. Yeah, most definitely. Um, let's switch gears and look at uh, what's going on in commodities today. In particular, natural gas seeing a big move and a, a bearish trend. Milder temperatures are keeping demand low and prices under pressure. RNS Frey is here with more on the action. Hi, Ines. Hi, Julie. Yeah, and we have seen this trend when it comes to natural gas. I'm going to pull up our Wi-Fi interactive board so you can see how much we're down with natural gas over the last couple of months. I'm going to pull it up right here. Uh, over the last two months, it's down 27 percent, more than 27 percent. Now, why is this happening? As you just mentioned, we are seeing some milder weather here in the U.S. It's already December. There is also a tremendous amount of storage of natural gas. In fact, the latest EIA data is showing that in late November, stockpiles were up 9.8% over November of 2022, also up 8.6% over the last five-year average. So we are seeing some record production also of natural gas that's at play. That's also pressuring the markets as well. We saw, you'll remember, last year, Europe's natural gas prices went to record highs. Here in the U.S., you had natural gas soaring above $10 per million British thermal units. Those are the units that it is uh, quantified in. We just started the peak demand season now for natural gas. January would be the ultimate peak in demand. So if this warmer weather persists, there are some analysts that are saying that you could see this number of natural gas at two point, uh, below $2. Now, analysts are saying that they're anticipating that there is more demand that will meet the supply. On the bright side, what they're saying is, is that, look, this is oversold territory right now, so you should see a correction to the upside. Uh, one other note is that in Europe, if we do see prices spike in Europe, this will also have an impact here in the U.S. because the U.S. exports liquid natural gas. So, by the way, if these trends, though, stay the same going down, uh, you could see your energy bill much lower this winter, especially if you heat your home with gas, guys. And yes, Ferre, thank you so much. Thank you. Deal activity driving a lot of action in the media space. Some of the big movers in today's session, Paramount Global and Altus. Paramount pulling back from gains last week that Sherry Redstone is considering selling and controlling stake in National Amusement. That's the parent of the entertainment giant. Altus under pressure on a CNBC report. It may sell Cheddar News to a private equity firm. Joining us now is Matthew Harrigan, analyst at Benchmark. So Matthew, thank you so much for joining us. I um, want to start actually, uh, Matthew, with Paramount because that's been making a lot of headlines, these reports uh, that uh, the parent company may be sold, Matthew. I know you don't directly cover that name, but just interested to get your, your general take on those headlines as, as an analyst who covers the space. Sure, I think it's a bit of a surprise. I mean, my colleague, Dan Kernos, our, our broadcast analyst, actually follows the name. And uh, I think that they're really starting, or really starting to improve operations in, in a number of regards. I mean, you're above 60 million uh, subscribers now on, on Paramount Plus to take one instance. And I think it's a little surprising that after everything they've gone through that uh, they'd be willing to sell at a, what would be a probably a heavily discounted price to some of the parts uh, valuation. I don't think that's any, any news. I mean, most of these media conglomerates have traded at very significant discounts. I mean, maybe for 15 or 20 years apart from uh, momentary uh, bubbles, but I, 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 you know, I think my colleague would be inclined to downplay it, you know, somewhat, but I think there is a real imperative to get, you know, more scale when you look at uh, the competition relative to not just even uh, Netflix and Disney, but also Amazon and, and others. So, and Matthew, just more broadly here, when you look at this landscape, um, 
it feels like that there is a lot in play <laughs> in terms of deals and deal activity potentially happening in 2024. Is that what you see? Do you expect an uptick? Well, I think the, the media group is really in kind of perma play. I mean, every year at the Allen and Company uh, conference, so I, I think people are always talking and action uh, you know, can be another matter. I mean, some of the, the longer standing, uh, you know, deal, uh, this deals that people talked about, you know, with Viacom and the Paramount Global haven't happened. And then people have been really taken aback by, by certain surprises. So uh, I, I think there is an imperative to get more consolidation. I, I think there's probably some residual antitrust concern, even though it may not be rational for certain businesses. I mean, you may recall that, you know, theater deals were very difficult for a number of years because of a Supreme Court ruling going back to 1954. And I think you could probably have a little bit of resistance in Washington to combining uh, broadcast networks and, and and particularly if you combine the news operation. You can see what's happening in the UK right now with the Telegraph and uh, Jeff Zucker and, and potentially, uh, you know, Abu Dhabi being uh, supposedly a passive potential uh, an investor in concert with, with, with Zucker. So I, I think people are talking, certainly. But, uh, you know, talking is, is very is very difficult to satisfy all parties when you look at the uh, valuations right now in traditional media. And Matthew, I, I meant to ask you, kind of touch, go, going there where I, where I wanted to head anyway, this idea of consolidation in the, in the space, Matthew, you know, you can make the case financially, strategically, but you're also, I'm just curious how you think the Biden administration acts. You know, you have a much more aggressive FTC right now. Are there certain kinds of deals, Matthew, that you, you think might, might be more likely to get done given that kind of regulatory backdrop? Well, as, as you just pointed out, I mean, the, the Justice Department has done a considerable pivot from, uh, you know, they really didn't like uh, vertical uh, M&A and, and horizontal was M&A was tolerated. I mean, Amazon could go into completely new business and no one look at, would look at a sconce at them. And I think now there's a, a broader awareness of just really overall, you know, cloud, uh, not, not just even on economic influence, but on, on political influence. So I, I would certainly say that the, the the uh, Biden Justice Department is much more uh, uh, unhappy or, or skeptical of, of M&A than they would have been under the Trump, Trump administration. But of course, you know, if Trump were to come back into office, uh, you know, some, uh, you could have some fairly politicized uh, reviews of potential activity there as well. And given how long some of these reviews are, are, are take, you can take, you, you, you could well end up ex extending into the next administration as you try to do a large, large deal right now. Right. Um, I want to go to something you've written about recently as well with regard to Warner Brothers Discovery. Um, and that has to do with bundling, which is sort of like what's old is new again, right? And you're not getting the cable bundle, but you're getting the streaming bundle, I guess. Um, do you think Warner Brothers is, is pretty and relatively well positioned in that regard? You know, I think the company was was really quite not dissing AT and T, but it was badly uh, mismanaged for about five years. And I think that the current management, you know, clearly they've gotten a lot of profile for for gutting costs and honestly for the compensation package for for the C C CEO. But I think they're doing a much better job on the creative side, especially at the studio with the uh, with DC Comics. And, and it is funny. I mean, people don't feel like subscribing to six a la carte networks. I mean, the, the cable bundle certainly has had some artificiality in terms of pricing and paying, paying for networks. You're not going to watch, you know, two minutes of in an entire year. But at the same time, I, mean, I think it, it's natural. I mean, you know, frankly, I mean, people want good content. I mean, the, the consumption is clearly gravitating towards streaming. You know, I, I think that the Disney charter deal provides somewhat of a template for people being able to get content in linear or, or streaming form. But yes, I mean, people want to be able to uh, get everything uh, just like the old days and in, in the in the delivery conduit that they prefer, which is generally streaming apart from live sports and news. Right. Matthew Harrigan, thank you so much. Really appreciate your time this afternoon. My pleasure. Coming up, we had breaking news from Oracle. Those earnings numbers coming out and the shares are down by 8%. We'll give you the numbers, bring you analysis and tell you why those shares might be down. We'll be right back.
Shares of Oracle are sliding 8% after hours as the company reported second quarter earnings, its fiscal second quarter, missing adjusted revenue estimates. It did beat slightly on the bottom line. Adjusted revenue for the company at $12.94 billion. That's versus the estimate for $13.04 billion. This is even though total revenue did rise by 5%. So it was a year-over-year -year gain. It just wasn't as large as analysts had predicted here. Adjusted earnings per share beating by just a penny, a buck $34.33. 33 is what analysts have been looking. And just to run down the different areas of business here, cloud revenue up 25% to $4.8 billion. Cloud infrastructure revenue up 52%. That was the biggest growth area to 1.6%. Cloud application revenue. You ready for all the different mm. kinds of cloud revenue here? Cloud <laughs> application revenue up 15% to $3.2 billion. Those are the three biggest lines of businesses here for Oracle. Yeah, Oracle CEO Safa Katz trying to sound kind of a bullish tone here saying demand for our cloud infrastructure and generative AI services is increasing at an astronomical rate. She goes on to say that business is good and getting better, but obviously the initial take here uh, is not positive for investors. On the call, that's when you would, would typically hear Safra Katz um, give guidance. So we'll be waiting for that. You know, this stock, Julie, had had a nice run into this print. It was up about 40%, obviously selling off here, at least initially. I think some big questions I think I know analysts want to hear on the call, just about the broader cloud environment, what it looks like. Is management still comfortable with this long-term call they put out there, 20 billion plus uh, of cloud revenue by the end of fiscal 24? AI questions as well. When does Oracle really think generative AI is going to start generating some, just some meaningful tailwinds for OCI or Oracle Cloud Infrastructure? That's that plat public cloud service competing with the giants like the Amazons and the Microsofts. Yeah, and Larry Ellison, of course, the chairman and CTO, chiming in in the release also. And he seems to be talking about still just the huge demand for cloud services. He talks about the expansion of their data centers, that they're building 100 new cloud data centers. He said they build them very quickly. They operate very efficiently. They're higher, high um, performance here, and they operate them inexpensively. So he, said, he talks about them being connected to Microsoft Azure. So, you know, Again, to your point, there's nothing negative tone-wise in this release, so it's really going to hinge on the call here and what they have to say there about what's going on with Oracle the Oracle call is a good call, by the way. Larry yeah. Ellison, oh. I'm th sure. Throw sharp elbows, Larry. Yeah. <laughs> All right, moving on. City optimistic on stocks for the full year 2024, but not without some expected turbulence. Here with the details is Yahoo Finance's very own Madison Mills. Madison. Well, later we're going to talk about Larry Ellison speaking at my graduation because I have oh. some stories about that. But first we'll talk about this city note. Uh, the headline here is don't chase the rally, but get in on the pullback. They're saying that this rally we're seeing towards the end of 2024, it may not have legs heading into next year. And that's because we might see some softening due to some volatility around what the Fed might be doing next. They say that you can't uh, anticipate anticipate the expected movements around, you know, the markets responding to the macro movements the way they have traditionally, because we're in such a weird environment right now, you guys, as we talk about all the time here. So in terms of how this impacts their price targeting, they're lowering their mid-year target from 5,000 down to 4,800. They're still keeping their end of year target at 5,100. The options market has an implied move there for the end of the year at 4,800. So a little bit more bullish uh, than that year end target from the options market perspective, but the big news here, lowering that mid-year target to anticipate some Fed move softening. Yeah, it's interesting because it fe felt like things were sort of coalescing around 5,000 or towards the upper end there from most of the strategists on the street. You know, you've been reading a lot of notes. We've been reading a lot of notes. Did this one feel less optimistic in tone? Well, it is, right? I mean, yeah. it's a push down and kind of a hedge for them that the first half of the year, okay, guys, maybe that first half of the year is yeah. not going to be so great, but we're going to have that rally in the second half of the year. I also thought that it was interesting that they did have that optimism still around uh, broadening outside of that Magnificent Seven. A lot of these notes, people have been talking about the small caps, the Russell. Uh, they just say, just go into the equal weighted S&P. We don't need to do anything crazy to broaden out our portfolios, just maybe diversify into 
the equal weighted S&P 500 to start getting a little bit more exposure into those smaller cap names. But it certainly is an admission that the first half of next year is not going to be uh, this fantastic ride due to Fed uh, loosening, I should say. And the big headline from them in the second half of the note, too, they say, be careful what you wish for and expect the unexpected. Mm. Any like when they talk about macro complications for yeah. next year, what do they call out, Madison? They talk about the election. They talk about how there's, you know, always risk in an election year, even though we know that election years typically are good for the stock market. They also talk about geopolitical risks. Um, they mentioned that fiscal restraint heading into 2025 could also be an issue. They talk about higher taxes potentially weighing on the stock market and that that could have an implication for profit margins coming up in earnings calls. Um, one other thing, too, is that on the disinflation picture, they mentioned that disinflation could be bad for profit margins, which I always find to be mm. such a fascinating catch-22, because if I see disinflation, I feel like I'm going to be swiping the credit card even more. But if we're in a recession, obviously that's not going to happen. So it's just a tough balance right. to Unless walk. Pricing pressure, maybe pressure on margins, too, as a result. Right. Okay. What was the Larry Ellison advice for, for <laughs> in the graduation speech? He talked about um, going through changes in his marriage and how that oh, related really? to um, ownership of yeah. his boat and that that was uh, important for us to note the rocky ships of life as we entered the workforce in 2016. So, I, I mean, it was very that impactful That was not what I was me. expecting. Yeah. I don't know what I was expecting, but that was <laughs> no. not it. It I made like an impact. It. She remembers Obviously. it. I mean, all of us related to having a Boat sure, sitting there sure, in sure. Our and getting sure. and getting a divorce and getting a divorce. So it was, um, yeah, it changed my life. Good Gary, life. bringing it home, <laughs> making it relevant. Exactly. That's why he's called in. Maddie Mills, thank you so much for that. Thank you. And coming up here at Yahoo Finance, we're counting down the top ten stories of 2023. And after the break, we'll reveal number ten. That's next.
We are counting down to the top 10 stories of 2023 here at Yahoo Finance. And coming in at number 10, X becomes X. Twitter isn't worth what it used to be. After paying $44 billion for the social media company in October, Elon Musk now values his company at just $20 billion. In a tweet, Musk announcing that he's found a new CEO. Well, the Securities and Exchange Commission is suing Elon Musk to force him to testify about his purchase of Twitter, now known as X. Overall, 2023 has been a real turnaround year for X. It has been indeed quite an eventful year for the social network, formerly known as Twitter. X got a new name and CEO, but the platform is also contending with several hurdles due to owner Elon Musk's controversial posts. Here with a snapshot of the year in review for X, Yahoo Finance's Dan Helley is here with us on set. So let, let's let's run through the year that was for X, shall we? Yeah, uh, it's been a lot for the company. Here's just a few of the biggest things that happened in the year that X became X. Let's kick things off in March when news came out that, as you had said in the past, uh, Twitter's valuation dropped from $44 billion that Musk, Musk paid for the company to just $20 billion. Then that same uh, month, Musk named Linda Yaccarino the new CEO of Twitter, and then he took over the role of CTO. Although from what we've been seeing, I don't even know what that means at this point. Uh, <laughs> smelling some blood in the water, Mark Zuckerberg and Meta in July launched their Twitter competitor threads in a bid to grab users and more importantly, advertisers who disapproved of Musk's decision to reinstate previously banned accounts and his own controversial comments. And then also in July, Musk did the famous rebrand. He ended Twitter, killed the bird, and turned it into X. He said the company hit a, a new all-time high of 531 million monthly users. Then in September, Musk said advertising revenue for X was down 60%. And then he blamed the Anti-Defamation League, saying the group which fights anti-Semitism was the biggest generator of anti-Semitism content on X. He then met in, uh, with Prime Minister, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu to discuss AI as well as anti-Semitism. Then he claimed that X had 550 million monthly active users. Uh, in October, we're not even done with the year yet somehow, the SET, SEC sued Musk to force him to testify about a probe into Twitter share purchases around the time Musk was buying the company. In November, uh, this is going to be the big month, it was miserable for X. First, Musk expressed support for an anti-Semitic post drawing condemnation from the ADL, White House, and advertisers. Then, after left-leaning Media Matters for America issued a report saying that ads on X for companies including Apple, IBM, and others appeared next to Nazi content, advertisers began pulling out of the company. After that, Musk went on a rant about advertisers during an interview at the New York Times Dealbook Summit, cursing out companies that pulled their ads and specifically calling out Disney CEO Bob Iger. More recently, just this week, Musk reactivated conspiracy theorist Alex Jones's account, and then he also made Grok, the ChatGPT rival for X.AI, available for X Premium Plus subscribers. So, whoa, interesting. How is this not number one? I don't understand, but you know, whatever. I'll, I'll, I'll give it for number 10. Uh, just a, a mind blowing year for this company. Uh, probably not Linda Yaccarino's favorite time to be part of a company. No. Um, you know, it's interesting that, I mean, that's a lot of drama. That's yeah, a lot, yeah. that's a lot of headlines. What do you, what do you think is ahead for 2024? Or, or let me ask you this, when you think about its business, just the economics of X, do you think it's advertising, given all the challenges there? Is it subscriptions? Is it AI? Is it some combination it's of those the, three? It's the super app. Yeah, yeah. is I that mean, it? it is. Look, uh, advertising and, and, you know, We've seen advertisers pull out yep. of X before. They've also pulled out of Facebook, by the way, and then you know everybody jumped back on because they're like, well, we need to show our stuff to people. So yeah. you know, we'll see how long this all lasts, right? Um, but advertising is still its key revenue driver, but they are continuing to push the subscription service. They have the X Premium, X Premium Plus, and you know, the Premium Plus is so you don't have ads. Premium is you see fewer ads, but you're still paying, so why do you see ads to begin with? I don't really get that. Um, so it's, it's going to be the subscription model and then adding more features to uh, X 
Premium and Premium Plus. So that's where the Grok comes in with Premium Plus. They're kind of trying to make it more of an app where everything happens. You can also upload much longer video content with the more premium subscription service. So that's really where, where the revenue goes. But I mean, you know, there's been predictions from some companies where they say, look, this is where X ends. I don't really think so. Everybody says the demise of these social networks mm. is coming and then it never happens. And you know, for, for X, obviously it's not a publicly traded company at the moment. They seemingly want to do that in the future. We'll see. But you know, they said the same thing about Meta and then, you know, its share prices shot up. So I, I don't know if necessarily this is this is going to be the end. People still want to advertise. Yeah, I'm just sad that they're using Grok, for, which is from one of my favorite yeah. novels from when I was younger, Stranger in a Strange Land, but be that as it may. Um, you know, it's also interesting to me because you do have these competing social networks, right? And I know you went through the litany of all the things. Alex Jones, like, is that, you know, what is the Rubicon here when it comes to X, right? Because there's the, it, it, when you recite all of the things that have happened in the past year, what is the thing like beyond which that's the tipping point in some way? Like and when do they go beyond the pale? Uh, like, yeah. I, I don't think they do, right? I think, you know. I guess it depends on who you ask or who's using the platform or who you want to use the platform or whatever else, right? I, th I think the, the only thing that can have a big negative impact on X outside of advertisers leaving um, and people condemning Elon Musk for his uh, behavior is if something comes along that can actually replace it. Now I mentioned Threads. Threads isn't exactly blowing up. You know, it's not like this huge uh, mind-blowing app. A lot of that has to do with the functionality that it doesn't offer, right? They can bring over people. People, you know, every once in a while I see people come on saying, uh, you know, I'm done with X, uh, whatever, but they need a kind of desktop replacement version of threads mm -hmm. with you know what used to be TweetDeck for uh, professionals in social media. And you know, I mean, then you'll start to see probably people leave X more and more. But there's also true believers, right? Who think yes. that Elon Musk is the end all be all and they mm -hmm. wanna follow him into whatever area he starts tweeting about next. So we'll, we'll just have to see. I mean, you know, he's, he's the CTO, uh, but he commands so much of the attention of that company that, you know, I said it before jokingly, but you know, is Linda Yaccarino getting the due respect that she deserves as CEO when he's going on stage and telling the people that she's supposed to be working with to basically take a hike? I, you gotta wonder. So yeah, I, I don't think there's anything though that's beyond the pale at this point. I like how you went with take a hike there, which felt yeah. like a much more family-friendly version of what was actually said. In my head, that I was, was like, nice don't pivot. say what he actually said. <laughs> yeah. Dan Hallie, thank you. Dan. Thank, thank you, buddy. You. All right, moving on, we are taking a closer look at leadership and corporate governance, not just about Elon Musk. The recent saga at OpenAI also, of course, highlighting the importance of governance. Joining us now is Diligent CEO, Brian Stafford. So Brian, thank you so much for joining us. I actually want to start maybe, Brian, kind of high level, before we get into the specific names. Um, I'm interested, Brian, and this is a world you know so well, when you think about corporate governance, as we wrap up 23, 2023, we head into 2024, how much has that actually changed? How much has, has it evolved, Brian, over let's say the last five, 10 years? Because we know business sure has evolved. Yeah, it's a great question, Josh. Over the course of the last, I'd say five years, governance has changed quite materially um, across the corporate landscape. And by that, I mean, everything has come faster and faster and faster at boards and leadership teams. And so from a governance perspective, you see more conversations, more intensity and more rigor um, evolving uh, the way that large companies focus on governance. We work with 25,000 companies, 700,000 board members, and each and every one of you, one of them would tell you that governance has gotten way more intense over the course of the last five years. And yet we still get our big stories that, that we cover here, Brian, don't we? About these kinds of blow ups, you know, about what happened at OpenAI, for example, um, and the sort of what effectively was a fight uh, within the boardroom, it seems, for the future of that organization. Um, how does that sort of play out, you know, not just when it comes to a head, but even earlier in the process when they're choosing people for the boards, when they're vetting people for the boards, et cetera? Well, I mean, I think the open eye situation showed us what other situations have within tech, where sometimes investors 
run and leap into investing in companies that don't have proper governance. I think what you're finding in each of these situations are making sure that you have proper governance, making sure you have proper controls, making sure you have the right board composition is a material thing that impacts how companies operate, but also impacts the way investors think about returns, investors think about stability. And in the case of open AI, even someone like a Microsoft thought about you know, building a platform, building technology around a company um, that uh, had a shaky, uh, had shaky governance. I'm interested too about when you think about board members today, has that changed at all in terms of who should be serving on these boards? Should companies be looking for different resumes, different backgrounds, different skill sets than maybe let's say five years ago? Yeah, I think that's absolutely correct. I think if you look over the course of the last five years to your point, Governance really is an exercise in risk oversight or risk management. And if you look at the different risks that have come across companies over the course of the last five years, it has grown, whether it's climate as a risk, whether it's talent diversity, whether it's geopolitics, uh, whether it is uh, the pandemic and health issues, and now even AI, and having your board members just be composed of people who are former CFOs or even CEOs uh, leaves most companies at um, maybe lacking the expertise to quickly deal with and address some of the risks that exist today. Um, so let's talk about some of those risks too, because AI, I guess, is a big opportunity, but it's also a big risk uh, for some of these companies. So how are boards sort of attacking that? And are they do they have the expertise they need? Well, all boards are talking about it. We do a survey of board members across our 700,000 board members and C-suite users, and 51% of directors said they've discussed AI more frequently and more detail in the past year, which is probably obvious. 31% are seeking education and benefits of learning more through AI, and 75% of them actually see AI playing a bigger role in the boardroom. I think most organizations are seeing AI um, have the potential to have a transformative impact but also trying to mitigate and think through the concerns or risks associated with AI. Beyond AI, Brian, you know, you listen, being is, is the depth and breadth of your knowledge here is, is helpful when you have these conversations. Beyond AI, are there other issues that are, you know, in your conversations front and center right now? I think the issue front and center for boards, especially in the US right now, is cyber and cyber risk. And so the SEC has passed a resolution that makes sure that companies have to disclose any cyber attacks um, by later this month in, in December. And so cyber is on the top of mind of many, many, many boards, and especially challenges with SolarWinds and actually CISOs getting more, more focus and potential more um, litigation against companies. I'd say cyber is top of mind for every board. So we're going to get a flood of, of cyber uh, uh, reports before the end of the year is what you're saying? you're going to get an increase of cyber disclosures and regulations, and you're going to see more and more of these happen over the course of next year. You're going to be able to take a look at and compare, why did a company disclose this when their competitor didn't disclose this? Mm. You're going to look at the, the extent of the disclosure, and you're going to find investors, activist investors, um, regulators, holding an even higher bar up to the level of oversight provided in cyber across many companies. Interesting stuff. Brian, good to see you. Thanks a lot. Brian Stafford of Diligent, appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Shares of Lucid following an after hours trading as the company is announcing the departure of its CFO, Sherry House. Lucid saying in a press release, House is resigning from her position effective immediately to pursue other uh, opportunities. Our Prof Subramanian is here to talk more about this. This is not the first management change that Lucid has had, right? Hasn't there been some moving around? Uh, I think so, yeah, there has yeah. been, but uh, CFO Sherry House is one of the biggest to, to leave yeah. here. She's been there for the company for a long time now, was there during the IPO, uh, or should I say their uh, reverse SPAC merger, I believe mm -hmm. it was with uh, yes. Churchill. Anyway, yeah, so she's leaving and be replaced by Gagan Dingra, who is Lucid's VP of Accounting and Principal Accounting Officer. He'll, he'll serve as the interim CFO there. Now on Friday, the company was, was removed from the NASDAQ 100, along with a couple other companies there, who, uh, from, a, from a, I think from a performance point of view, Julia, I, I imagine that's why. Uh, rough year for the stock, obviously. Up, up a little bit this month, but down 30% this year. Um, time and time again this year, they've had to raise money through either stock, op stock offerings or debt offerings or a combination of both. You know, it's been a tough road so yeah. far for EVs this year. And we saw Fisker earlier, th earlier this, uh, sorry, a month ago, uh, lose its CFO too. So it's a rough time here at the end of the year for these e pure play EV com companies. I mean, we've, we've had some analysts come on the show, Praz, who, you know, listen, I wouldn't say they're not 
not bullish on that name, they don't have a buy rating, but they would point out that, you know, in their opinion, it does have some strength, Lucid. They'll talk about, you know, they'll say, listen, the company makes good vehicles. They'll talk about, you know, license agreements they have with Aston Martin. They'll also bring up, you know, the deep pockets, right, with, mm -hmm. with the Saudis. But what are some of the, the main challenges for Lucid? I mean, is it is it brand awareness? Is it production, cash burn? What do, I think it's a couple, of, I think it's they operate in that higher tier luxury space, which is pretty competitive and of course higher pricing. Yeah, right. Uh, they went with the, they didn't go with the asset light model, right? They, they actually are, they have a factory in Casa Grande, Arizona, they have a factory in Saudi Arabia. They're building the cars from scratch, not using a contract manufacturer. That's different than what Fisker is doing and that potentially is a cash drain and cash burn that maybe some investors aren't comfortable with. And the Saudis, you know, they have unlimited money, but how long will they keep writing checks for them? That's, I think that's the big question. Yeah, it's interesting. I'm just looking at House's background a little bit more. She was only worked there for about two and a half years. She was at Waymo before. Mm -hmm. um, so interesting that her tenure was not that long before leaving Lucid. So yeah. we'll see what happens here. See where she ends up, right? Yeah, yeah. most definitely. Praj, thank you. Appreciate it. All right, coming up, Yacht Morial Finance after the break. Welcome to Yahoo Finance's group chat. I'm Josh Schaefer here with Pras Subramanian and Alexandra Canal. And today we are kicking things off with a new story uh, and the new face of streaming, maybe. Tucker Carlson launching his own online channel. It's going to come with a $9 monthly fee. This is going to stream directly on Tucker's website called the Tucker Carlson Network. And essentially he's going to bring back... The old Tucker Carlson show, it seems. It's not entirely clear exactly what the full scope of content is going to be, obviously, because we haven't seen full episodes of the show, but we know he's been streaming on X. He's been doing sort of similar kind of interviews to he used to do while he was doing that on X. Uh, the Wall Street Journal report on this noted that they had initially sought to do this through X, and then they couldn't figure out to, a way to really work the subscription aspect to it. I think mm -hmm. the biggest thing that sticks out to me here 
is one of the most or one of the most popular people on cable news thinking he can fetch nine dollars a month, seventy two dollars a year from viewers to just watch his show. Yeah, it's would be high, would, high would be monumental for streaming if someone could do that on their own. It's more expensive than Netflix with ads, right? It's six ninety nine. Yeah, more expensive with that. And it just makes me think about how fragmented the industry is overall. We have so many streaming services on the market. I've spoken with so many experts about this. That's why you're seeing more bundling across the board to try and really retain new subscribers. Uh, make sure that those subscribers that are on your platform aren't leaving the platform for competitors. So it makes you wonder, do we need another streaming service out there? And if we do, does news work on streaming. I mean, we saw sort of that demise of CNN's streaming service last year. They're back. It's now incorporated into the Max app. And uh, we haven't gotten too many details on the success of that. But we know that at least Warner Brothers Discovery is leaning into news on streaming. Mm. I just wonder if this will work completely on its own, because we haven't necessarily seen that yet. Yeah, I mean, it sort of reminds me in a different space, the Joe Rogan deal with Spotify, right. that massive deal where he's he's monetizing that huge following does he ha that, that he has. And Tucker, Tucker Carlson obviously has a huge following, was a top-rated show on Fox uh, News back in those days. But, but like you mentioned, even, even now, even for his devoted fans, do you want to pay for another streaming service that you're already sort of paying for on top of everything else? You know, maybe this is a, you know, Dave Letterman, right, went to Netflix, right? He has a show. Uh, John Stewart in, in, at Apple. Maybe it'll be like that where... Obviously, they're with partners, but he's on his own with whoever the, the backers are. I can't remember who they are right now. But um, yeah, interesting to see that. Uh, I think it's going to be uh, wild to see where that goes. But Tar Carlson, I mean, the guy is a big name still. Yeah, you would think he certainly has a loyal audience, right, and always had a loyal audience. So to me, I think it makes a ton of sense if he's able to pull it off. Yeah. Because... What is your overhead here? You know, how many employees are you actually do you actually have where yeah. you're distributing that cost? So if you're able to get a lot of people to do this, mm -hmm. from Tucker's perspective, I think it makes a ton of sense. And you don't have the network telling you maybe what to do or what not to do, right? You kind of get to do your own thing, which I think some of these bigger names want to do. Maybe it's a test if it's successful. Maybe, you know, you could have another company want to gobble that up when we're talking about consolidation yeah. and MA in the space. And Josh, you mentioned, you know, this production cost is, if it's just a glorified podcast, how much do you need, right? Mm. Just come to the dark side. No, just <laughs> uh, sticking with subscription services, it seems JLo was wrong when she said love don't cost a thing. Uh, not the case with these dating apps and premium service with these dating apps here. Um, we're seeing that, uh, especially if you want exclusivity, some of these are fairly expensive. Hinge's X premium service costs $50 a month or 600 a year. Uh, Tinder Select VIP costs $4.99 a month, so uh, hinges doesn't look like a bad deal. Mm -hmm. And finally, the league, which I cannot believe, I cannot believe this, $9.99 a week or t almost $2,500 a month. Uh, real expensive to be single these days. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what you guys think, but... I mean, this is crazy. I know, I've you know, just done some market research. You know, I've, I've been on these apps for a very short amount of time, and we should do that show, <laughs> right? Yep. Exactly, in the wild. But you try these apps, and you do realize that you need to pay up in order to get any quality matches. And then you notice that everyone's on the same apps. So mm -hmm. it, so it sort of doesn't lead to anything in my experience. And then you think about the, the business side of this all and, and the stock market side of this. Wells Fargo initiated coverage of Match Group, which owns Hinge and Tinder along with Bumble last week. They give an equal rating to Match with a $32 price target, while Bumble, they give an overweight rating and $19 price target. Now, part of the bullishness with Bumble does stem from the introduction of that premium plus tier, which is that subscription tier for Bumble, and how that could support revenue growth. So at least on the Wall Street side, they're thinking these subscriptions are going to do well, but I don't know how that translates with the consumer. Uh, yeah, yeah, I think you just want to make more money off the people on your app, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not different than most of sort of the products we cover. And one other thing I would just add, Max CFO, or Max Group CFO Gary Swidward was talking last month and sort of saying he thinks Hing has become more popular than Tinder among the younger, younger generation because it takes more effort to go on Hinge. You have to add up all these photos, right, prompts, there's more prompts, yeah. mm. versus Tinder you kind of just sign up, so people like that opt-in. I wonder if that's part of the paid thing too. You know the person's committed if they're paying $2,500 to talk oh to you. Oh gosh. I heard one, <laughs> one quick, one quick, thing, a quick thing I heard was that people who are non-premium tend to be not real, is what people are saying. They're just like, they're just like you know, bots. 
<laughs> and then you got to pay up to actually meet real people. Like know. like bots is in like the figurative sense or literal bots? Like fake people. <laughs> we got to spend more time on the apps. That's the takeaway. <laughs> Guys, all right. Well, we're moving on from apps to what's going on in Hollywood. And the Glo Golden Globe nominations are out. And there's one streamer leading those noms. Netflix with 28 in total, 13 for film, 15 for TV. HBO slash Max has the most TV nominations with 17 in total. And we always tend to see that battle between Netflix and HBO, especially when it comes to the Globes. But I really want to focus in on the film side because despite that double strike, in Hollywood that we saw. We did get a pretty sizable turnout at the box office this summer thanks to Barbenheimer and Barbie and Oppenheimer leading those film nominations, but a lot of love for the streamers as well. To me, this just proves, looking at the different streamers on this, that they need the award shows to matter. I think we've had a lot of discussion in the last year or two about the award shows maybe going, the significance going away, right? But when you think about the streaming wars, when you think about the price wars, trying to get people to your platform, this is one of your biggest activation moments for me. Show me five shows I didn't see, have people talk about them because they're in the Golden Globes, and then maybe I go download the streamer. That's what I think they need to, I think the streamers need to play an active role in that and sort of make these shows matter again and make them big. Yeah, you know, looking at Apple, right? Mm -hmm. uh, a couple of TV shows, Ted Lasso on the morning show doing well, but the Killers of the Flower Moon, yeah. that's their big marquee thing. They spent a lot of money for that, and they're, they're getting the, the play there. But obviously, I think you're right, Josh. I make fun of these award shows, but for the industry, they're very important for driving people to go see these movies, whether in theater or on streaming. I haven't seen Killers of the Flower Moon, and now I want to go see it, yeah. right? Yeah, no, totally. And the Globes has sort of been this award show that's been in chaos right now, so we'll see if this year that could bounce back. We will, and that will come in a little over a month. But coming up next, what to watch tomorrow. We're going to break down some of the stories you need to know to start your Tuesday. Time now for What to Watch Tuesday. On the economic front, we're going to get the latest read on inflation, which is expected to show a continued slowdown. Headline CPI for November expected to come in flat from October and up 3% from a year ago. The core number, excluding volatile food and energy prices, expected to rise three-tenths of a percent. It's up slightly from October. The data will help inform the Fed's decision-making around rates. Central Bank kicking off its final scheduled meeting of the year tomorrow. And overseas, COP28 
28 coming to a close in Dubai comes as the group's final draft of its core agreement includes a range of actions but does not mention the phasing out of fossil fuels, which was a key demand by the European Union and many developing countries that are especially vulnerable to climate change. And Yahoo Finance is counting down to the new year. This week we're revealing the 10 biggest stories of 2023. Tune in all day for a look at the headlines that defined the year. Well, that'll do it for today's Yahoo Finance Live. Be sure to come back tomorrow at 3 p.m. Eastern for all of your coverage leading up to and after the closing bell. Happy Monday, folks.